So when we think of innovation, we typically think of a spatial metaphor of moving forward or reaching higher. Craig mentioned in his introduction, looking toward the horizon. But is this the right way to look at innovation? After all, 99.9% .9 of new ideas and new products fail. Probably a lot of you in this room could have given me that number. Did you also know that 99% of the species that have ever lived on Earth are now extinct? Novelty is inherently in unstable. Progress moves ever toward failure. Put simply, innovation is the first step toward stagnation. If we're constantly looking toward the horizon for the next step, sometimes we may miss what's around us. So I think a better spatial metaphor for innovation is a lateral shift, tapping into what people are already doing, giving it a new name, showing them a new way to think about it and then moving forward. I'm going to give you three brief examples that may help illustrate this. First, let's talk about digital music. Back in the 1970s, we started sharing music files with tape swapping, right? And then digital files made it a lot easier just to upload them to the internet and have people download them. Well, then Napster came along, gave us a familiar software interface, and let us share from our computer directly to the computers of those that were interested in our files. Now, of course, Napster got sued out of existence by a frightened music industry, but that gave Steve Jobs the opportunity to create iTunes and figure out a way to get people to pay for something they were already doing for free. And the next example I'm going to talk about is light bulbs. It's a very innovative uh, metaphor in and of itself. When Al Gore first gave his Inconvenient Truth talk, he was in the midst of trying to create gigantic regulatory change to, to, um, to stop this global climate crisis that he saw was coming. But he wasn't gaining traction. So in about 2007, he switched gears. He said, all right, everybody, why don't you just buy a new kind of light bulb? And that'll get us started on the right track. And it worked, because people were already buying light bulbs, and they could get their heads around just doing something a little bit different that could have a major impact. And then he went back to trying to promote the regulatory change that he wanted in the first place. And his audience was now more receptive to it. And finally, I want to talk about ebooks briefly. When ebooks first came out, they didn't really catch on, right? They were marketed as a new way to read books. But reading as an activity didn't really need early adopters. And so the forward spatial metaphor was dissonant to people. They already had a good way to read books, it was to open a book. And so there's been a shift in strategy, such that, so that this year will be the first year that ebooks outsell traditional books on Amazon.com. And that shift in strategy was just to say, okay, it's not a new way to read books. You already got that. But look what you're doing with music. You've gotten rid of your CDs, you've gotten rid of your tapes. It's all contained in your hard drives. Now you can do that with text. So we're going to give you a new way to select, find, organize, and consume the text in your life. And we've become more text heavy. And ebooks exploded in popularity. <clears throat> now I want to show you a brief video that will, you'll see both of these ideas in play. You'll see the idea of historical inevitability and innovation. You'll also see the idea of just putting a name to something that happened that people were already doing. You could look at air hockey as the culmination of centuries of Western technology, the Industrial Revolution, discovery of electricity, industrial blowers, rosins and plastics from petroleum, extrusion of aluminum, steel from iron ore, formica, you know, all these things that came about through the Industrial Revolution culminated in air hockey in 1972. So we always assumed that some one person conceived of this game, sat down and invented it. It didn't happen that way. The credit for really inventing air hockey as we know it is in dispute. There's a lot of mystery. Nobody's sure who invented air hockey, what, is what I believe. Well, the origins of air hockey were revealed to us in many, many mysterious ways. There were people working for uh, NASA. They were working on a prototype for hovercraft. So they used air cushion tables. 
that has this frictionless surface. Frictionless motion. A frictionless air environment. They had these puck-shaped things floating on the table. One of the inventors threw the disc down through the other end and said, I win. I win. I win. You're buying coffee this morning. One of the other inventors grabbed a, an eraser. Somebody said, oh, I have to let me defend myself. And he grabbed two erasers. So then they started hitting the disc with the eraser. And uh, their boss walked down and caught him and, and says, what are you guys doing? And the other guy said, um, well, we're playing air hockey. Uh, well, we're playing air hockey. Uh, we're, 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 we're playing uh, air hockey. And there was no question that that was the truth. We do it in Chicago, we do it in New York, we do it in LA, we do it all over the country. If anyone in the world can come there. As time moves on and I move closer to the grave, um, air hockey becomes more of a priority. <laughs> you, you, get, you, get you can be the same as You'll get tremendous publicity from it. What somebody needs to do, whether it's Dynamo or, or another company, is to actually pay somebody to promote air hockey. You know, you look at foosball, and they have people that, you know, that pay to run things and pay to, pay to promote it. So that clip is from Eric Anderson's documentary on organized air hockey, Way of the Puck. Um, and it, it leads me to wonder, do new ideas catch fire because they appear, or do they appear because they catch fire? Think about what would have happened if that first game of air hockey had taken place 10 years later during the rise of the video games when they were spreading like wildfire and creating a completely new arcade culture. Would a company like Brunswick have invested in the R&D to create a non-video table game in that environment? We obviously don't know the answer to that, but I think we can safely say that it was less likely. And so the problem with historical inevitability is that it always runs in to current context. And that leads me to a big question. What is your goal with innovation? And I want to give you an alternative metaphor that will illustrate both the lateral shift and help us answer that question. And it's called the runner and the race. I can't think of a human endeavor better suited to explaining a forward moving metaphor toward a goal than a race, running a race, right? I mean, when I'm running, all I want to do is get to the end. I don't know about you guys. So, but if you ask a competitive runner, they're gonna tell you a different story. They're gonna say that they have strategies throughout the race for every mile. Mile one, how long did it take them to get there? What does their body <coughs> feel like? What is their mental state? They're thinking about their preparation. They're thinking about their training regimen. How did it prepare them for this race? And they're also thinking about those small adjustments they can make that can pay big dividends, not just in the race that they're running, but in future races. And so the metaphor of a race, of a runner, as an innovator is incomplete. Because what's your goal with innovation? To make things better? That's a process, not a goal. And so a more complete metaphor is a runner not running a single race, because a single race ends, but a runner running many races, infinite races, each one linked to all those that have come before and all those that will come in the future. And so the answer to that big question, is innovation a goal or a process? Well, I think with social and sustainable innovations, we have to view it as a process. Because today's social and sustainable innovations may not meet tomorrow's current contexts. I know I started this, this talk off with some sobering statistics about failure, and it wasn't to, uh, to make you leave the room thinking I'll never innovate again. So I wanna leave you with some, some happy thoughts. I think that right now is perhaps the best time to introduce <coughs> social and sustainable innovations. And the reason is, is because we've got a culture of doers, of makers, of remixers that take other people's ideas and put their own stamp on them. This technological revolution we're living in gives everyone a voice because it gives everyone an audience. We can access these technologies to find the things that allow us to express our core identities. We can find that one thing, that one 
product, that one organization, or that one idea, and know that somewhere, someone out there is going to connect it with us. In his book, Microtrends, Mark Penn calls this the atomization of the consumer and the explosion of choice. <clears throat> now, a lot of people say that this is creating a culture of narcissism, especially among the millennials, as Craig talked about. I mean, we've all heard about the millennials. They need their organizations and their jobs to reflect their values, not the other way around. You guys may be familiar with the current crop of YouTube superstars that seem all too willing to trade their shame for fame. But I don't think this is an age of narcissism. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think it's an age of incredible bravery. Instead of selecting from a menu of options that were given to us, we're creating those menus with our own hands, each and every one of us. Paul Simon has a quote about songwriting and connecting with an audience that I think is relevant. <clears throat> he says, you have to be careful with people's attention spans. You have to be a good host to them because they're not gonna come in and do all the work right away. There's too much information, too many things coming at them, right? The music's coming, the rhythm's coming, too many things for the brain to process. So when the abstract images come in his songs, he wants that process to have already taken place. So those images can fall into the structure that the mind has already created for the song. And I challenge you to make that your goal with social and sustainable innovation, to create a structure so that when your ideas smash into this remix culture and all this energy that people have, the world will shift effortlessly in your direction. So I want to leave you with a final thought. Be brave. Put your ideas out there. And trust the people that are passionate enough about them to adopt them and make them their own. And if you can do that, then you can confidently champion both the birth of new ideas as well as their death.